Welcome, church, to our Wednesday night devotional refresh, close-ups of Jesus through the lens of Mark's gospel. So we're working our way through just verse by verse, chapter after chapter, studying the greatness of Jesus. And I'm thinking about Paul's words when he writes to the church at Corinth, and he talks about beholding the glory of the Lord. And he says that as we behold the glory of the Lord, our lives are transformed from one degree of glory to another. And I love that idea of looking at Jesus and then over time, it's a gradual thing. It's not just something that happens with one study, but as you feed your mind on the glory of Christ, Paul says something happens in the heart. That, that's, that's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our lives are by degree, he says, transformed from one degree of glory to another. And we've been working our way, just marching through Mark's gospel, the first couple chapters. Here's what I want to look at tonight. I think it's a great topic. Jesus teaches on how to get the most out of your Bible. And so we're going to be in Mark chapter 4, mostly, as we make our study tonight. How to get the most out of your Bible. Point number one. According to Jesus, the foundation and starting place for everything in the Christian life, and we're looking at the parable of the sower that Jesus talked about, and the soils and the seed being the word. And the first thing that Jesus stresses is the starting place for everything that's going to grow in my life, everything that's going to happen in my heart spiritually. Where do I begin? And what Jesus says is, you start with the word. The seed is the word. A sower sows the word. That's the quote from Mark 4, 14. And so the seed represents the word of, of God. It's said even clearer in Luke's account, Luke 8, 11, where it says the seed is the word. And so there's no doubt about what Jesus is talking about. And he says, the word is the, that's what the picture you get with a seed. The word is the starting place for everything that's going to happen spiritually in my life. So it's important that you start in the right place, that you look in the right place for the beginnings of a transformed heart. The Word is the starting place for everything else that the Holy Spirit wants to develop in my life. And the other thing is, I think it's important to remember this because a lot of Christians will get discouraged They'll get discouraged at the pace of spiritual growth if they forget what Jesus said here. The seed is the word. And you can't help but get the idea, Jesus is stressing there's a timing element. That, that if I confuse, that if I confuse sowing and harvesting, I'll be in for a lot of disappointments and let letdowns. I think there are a lot of people, they pick up their Bible and, and they think that what's going to happen every time they read it is they're going to be harvesting. And Jesus says, that's not the case. Many times I come and I pick up my Bible and I study and I'm not harvesting anything. What I'm doing is sowing. The seed is the word. So spiritual growth requires patience and it requires a discipline. It requires a discipline because you don't always see the harvesting every time you sow the seed of the word in your life. Somewhere along the way, all kingdom growth begins with seeds. And, and the same is true in Christ's kingdom. The, the, start with the right place. You, you can't build your Christian life on human opinion, human emotion, surveying the opinions of the culture. Seeing the vote of the crowds, it won't work. The only way spiritual growth starts is you get the word in. Get the word into your life. Remember years ago, one of, one of my top 10 picks for great Christian books is Harry Blameyer's book. It's an old book now, probably hard to get your hands on it. And it's called The Christian Mind. And he talks, he talks about the process of Christian thinking, thinking around the word of God. Listen to this quote. He writes and says, the marks of truth as Christianly conceived then are that it is supernaturally grounded, so he means it's revealed, 
not developed within nature, that it is objective and not subjective, that it is a revelation, not a construction, that it is discovered by inquiry, not elected by majority vote, and that it is authoritative and not a matter of personal opinion or choice. And I would suggest to you, start reading the word. It's seed. Sow it into your mind. And this is how you can tell if you're thinking like a Christian, loving God with your mind. So Blaine Myers isn't writing even primarily about the content of what you're studying as the process, the way a Christian thinks about things. He's talking about how you arrive at truth, how you think rightly about God, what you are looking at as seed, authoritative seed for the rest of the outworking of your life. So, point number one, the foundation and starting place, according to Jesus, for everything else in the Christian life. A sower sows the word, or Luke 8, 11, The seed is the word. Okay, point number two. And it's kind of related to the first point. The power of the word of God in my life is going to be affected not just by the quality of the seed sown, but my response to it. So as you read the parable, it, it really becomes all about lost opportunities. It is given to religious people. We know that because Jesus is talking about hearts that receive the word. A sower sows the seed. And he talks about the different hearts where the seed lands. So he's not talking about people that haven't heard the word. He's addressing people like me. He's addressing people like you. About lost opportunities, I say that because in three out of four cases, the Word never does all that the Lord would have liked, all that the sower would have liked. So faith does come by hearing, Romans 10, 17. But hearing involves more than just, than just reading. In other words, when Jesus points out that three of the four hearts don't receive the benefit from the word that they should have, what he's, what he's trying to say to me and to you is, we churchgoers, or at least cyber churchgoers, that exposure to the word, while it is seed, doesn't necessarily ensure results. If point number one deals with exposure to the word, the seed begins to change. If that's what point number one is, point number two is the obstacles, the obstacles to the seed in my life. Let's look at some of them. Point number three. It talks about these soil samples. So I'm looking at Mark 4, 4 through 8. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, the pathway in the old King James, I think. And the birds came. They swooped down and they devoured it. They ate up the seed. Jesus later identifies and says that's, that's the way the enemy works, when the seed just lies on the surface of the life. Verse 5. Other seed fell on rocky soil where it did not have much soil, so it wasn't very deep. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And, and when the sun rose, we've had these hot, scorchy kind of days lately. When the sun rose, it was scorched, this little shoot. And since it had no root, it withered away. Verse 7. Other seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it. What an image that is. Choked it. And it yielded no grain. And then, thankfully, verse 8, other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and even 100-fold. Let, let's go real quick because these are important uh, pictures that Jesus is painting on how the human heart responds to the seed of the word. So first, A, wayside soil. He talked about that in the fourth verse. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path. 
and the birds came and devoured it. Now, we don't know why. It's just a parable, and we're not given all the details. Here is soil. It's not bad soil. It's, it's called pathway soil. It's called wayside soil. Uh, the ESV just has it as, as um, a path. So it's the soil somehow had just become hard and packed down. Religious traffic. Just the repetition of routine thoughtlessly engaged in. Maybe some difficult trying experience of life. Uh, maybe fear, fear of the kind of changes that the word might bring into my life. I don't know what the situation is, but something made this heart packed down, impenetrable in some way. And so the seed just sat on the top. For whatever reason, it, it couldn't penetrate. Probably, James would say that the soil would represent ears that would hear only, not do. Hearers only, James would say. And, and, and when the soil can't penetrate deeply into the heart, oh, how we need to be careful about light surfacy responses. How we need to be careful about hearing the same thing over and over again without responding deeply in a way that works up the soil. When the soil just gets hard and the seed just sits on the top, there's nothing wrong with the seed but it won't have a chance. It won't stay. The birds will come and eat it up. Keep your heart soft and tender before the Lord. Then he talks about stony soil. I see that in verses uh, 5 and 6. Hope you have your Bible. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, the seed sprang up, since it had no depth of soil, and, and when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. So, boy, how Jesus knows our hearts. He, he points to this problem of fast starts and poor finishes. Um, there was excitement. Maybe there was a, a, an emotional pull, the right gathering, the right crowd, the right song, the right feel in the moment, and the person was moved and made a response, but it wasn't a deep response. And so there was joy, there was enthusiasm, there was the pat on the back and the shaking of the hand. But then, of course, it says the sun comes up. There's, there's, there's trials, there's difficulties, there's challenges. There are people that will poke fun at your new commitment to Christ. So usually in the face of trial, difficulty, opposition, persecution. But there's something else here. And I, I remember the day vividly when I was reading this parable and the Lord spoke to my heart. And it was uh, one of those life-changing moments. Jesus is probing really deeply in this second rocky soil picture. He said, he, I remember when he said to me that there are things down under the surface of life that no one else sees. And, you, and, and when you look at just the soil from the top, you can't see any reason why it shouldn't grow and be fruitful and productive, and it makes a good start. But down under the surface of the soil, there are hard things. You, you can see somebody with a plow and oxen moving along, and everything is just turning up this rich, dark earth so easily, and then there's a great big boulder under the surface, and that clank and that jarring moment. And so you look at my life, and I see your life, but, but what Jesus is addressing here is what no one else sees. The things under the surface of my life, the things in the, in, in the deep of my heart where the Lord speaks to me, you don't know whether I'm listening or not. But Jesus says, here's what happens. Let's say there's just one area, one isolated area of that big boulder, an unyielded area of my heart. What damage gets done? It's this. 
that the seed gets sown in all sorts of areas of my life. And what happens is it won't have life changing power until that thing is dug up and exposed and removed. The parts of our lives that no one else sees, Jesus says, that's what kills fruitfulness of the word. There's nothing wrong with the seed. There's nothing wrong with the word. There's something in the heart that is, doesn't that make you want to search your heart? What, what is it that is still unyielding under the surface of our lives? It's a beautiful picture Jesus paints. The third kind of soil, C, thorny soil. It, it's, he talks about it in Mark 4, 7. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Interesting, eh? Apparently, the seed isn't the only thing that grows in the soil. And the seed of the word isn't the only thing that grows in my heart. You and I uh, grow in our hearts, in our minds. We grow things that compete with God's word in our lives. So growth of all kinds takes place in my heart, in my mind. There are things that sow greed or bitterness or stubbornness. All those things can flourish. And Jesus is saying that many of our spiritual problems uh, stem from a different source than we think. It's not that we're not reading our Bibles. The problem isn't that the seed of the word isn't getting sown into our hearts. You go to church, you have sermons, you have Bible studies, you have classes, you have your devotions, you read Christian books. And yet, what is happening? The growth isn't taking place the way I would like. And what Jesus is saying here is, the problem isn't just adding the seed of the word. The problem is weeding out other things. So that spiritual growth doesn't just come by the addition of the word. It comes from the subtraction of things that compete with the word. Everyone's a sower. All of us. Atheists are sowers. Agnostics are sowers. Every moment of every day of our lives, we are all sowers. And the problem is, the human heart can't germinate everything to fruitfulness at the same time. When you read Luke's account, it's, it's even less comforting because Luke, Luke records Jesus as Jesus identifies what the thorns are. So we don't have to guess. In Luke 8.14, Jesus is explaining the parable now to his disciples, and he, and he says, and as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but, but as they go on their way, that's interesting. They hear the word, and then they're off onto other things. As they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. So the seed is the word, that first point. Everything starts, everything starts with the word. Secondly, there are obstacles to the word. So to hear it, you have to deal with the obstacles. And the, now those obstacles, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking at. Wayside soil, stony soil, thorny soil. And, and fortunately, we're left with these encouraging words about fruitful soil. It's in Mark 8. Other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing. And I'm thinking about, about uh, the words in the New Testament. If these are in you, Peter talks about these things being in you and are increasing. That's what Jesus is talking about. Other seeds fell into good soil, 4, 8, and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding 30-fold, 60-fold, and a hundredfold. I have a feeling that we need those encouraging words because, because every time you pick up the word, at, at least if you're like me, 
so many times you read the glorious things in the word, the seed of the word, and it, and it helps just to remind you of all that is lacking in your life, all that I am not and wish I was. And I think Jesus gives us these words to encourage our hearts that just as surely as that seed will grow, point number one, we have no idea how much, 30 times, 60 times, 100 times. So, so regardless of what you feel the moment you pick up your Bible, the promise is if, if we'll be careful of those obstacles to growth, there's so much more potential than we can imagine. 100 times, 100, picture that. Whatever you think Christ would like to do in your heart, multiply it by 100. And that's the change he wants to make through his word. If the soil is receptive and responsive and the seed gets under the surface and it has no obstacles with which to compete, the change that it can make in our hearts is stunning. And so that's why just about every time I wrap up these studies, you'll hear me say, church, stay devoted to the word. And, and if all you hear when I say that, if all you're hearing is a chore and you're missing the point, what I'm saying is, this is seed. It'll change your life a hundred times more than you think. What a beautiful parable. Jesus telling us how to get the most out of our Bibles. Let's pray. We want more than anything for the reception of your word to be life-giving. We don't want a theological download. Knowledge is important, but we don't want bare academics. There's a difference. That's why you said your word is like seed. It, it expands. It, it grows. It produces fruit. It does more than we can think. And so here we are, all of us, Minus so many things that we used to enjoy and have at our disposal. But what we have is your word. What we have is the seed. What we have is your Holy Spirit. What we have is the glory of Jesus through Mark's gospel. And our lives can be transformed miraculously as we root them day by day in heartfelt devotion to your word. Let that be the experience of Cedarview Community Church. Every single person. Let that be our experience as we study your word together in these sessions, on our own, in our devotions. Let us not be distracted from your transforming grace. I ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget Sunday morning, keeping your joy I want to talk about what Paul says about showing Christ to be great in this world, whether by life or by death. Showing Christ to be great in this world, whether by light, life or by death. And then Sunday night, when life seems to swallow you whole, 6.30, we'll be studying from the book of Jonah, true and false righteousness, and how to know which path you're walking on. Stay devoted to the word. It's seed, church and love one another. God bless you.